Well, good morning, everybody. Um, once again, welcome to Cosmic Coffee, live streaming to you from Lowell Observatory and here in Flagstaff. I'm Jeff Hall, an astronomer and the director of Lowell Observatory. As you know, each week on Cosmic Coffee, we touch on uh, different topics in astronomy. Um, a couple of months ago, uh, you may some of our regular viewers may remember an interview with Ruskin Hartley, the executive director of the International Dark Sky Association, where we talked about uh, some wide ranging um, dark sky matters. Um, today, we're going to return to that topic and focus in a little bit more on Flagstaff. And with me here this morning is uh, Chris Luganbuehl. Uh, Chris is a retired astronomer from the U.S. Naval Observatory. And now um, with the Flagstaff Dark Skies Coalition, um, Chris and I have been working together for many years on dark sky matters, both uh, in Flagstaff and around the state. And um, we're here today to discuss a little bit about how Flagstaff has approached preserving its dark skies and why and, and how this has really become an integral part of our, our community. So um, with that, I'm, we'll start off and I'm going to turn it over to Chris. First of all, um, you know, with the previous interview, we heard a little bit of Ruskin's take on on dark sky preservation and his philosophy about it, and maybe a good place to start is to hear how you approach the issue of dark skies, uh, Chris, and what you what you see as the, the purpose and the, the meaning behind it. Well, thank you, Jeff, and good morning, everyone. I wanted to, first of all, say, uh, recognize the, really, the groundbreaking work that the International Dark Sky Association has done for more than 30 years now. Uh, almost maybe uh, more than 40, uh, it has basically raised the awareness uh, worldwide to a degree that the night is uh, half of the day, every day, and that it's something unique about it that people need to be aware of. And that's really made a big difference, I think, and made it easier for communities like Flagstaff to plow further ahead and really make a difference in protecting the night uh, on the more local level. They've set a groundwork or a base that, uh, of awareness that really has made a big difference. Uh, Flagstaff, however, really has can trace its history much farther back than the International Dark Sky Association and their efforts beginning in the mid 80s. Uh, because Flagstaff, uh, because of Lowell Observatory and the Naval Observatory, uh, the astronomical institutions that have really been part of Flagstaff really from the get-go, particularly the Lowell Observatory, has always been aware of the special value of the night, partly because the observatories have made sure they are. Uh, in the mid-1950s, uh, it began with Flagstaff, actually uh, the uh, directors of Lowell Observatory and at that time and the Naval Observatory being concerned about the impacts of switching, sweeping advertising searchlights, which are used in large urban areas uh, to announce the opening of a new shopping center or some other special event. Uh, some of the astronomers had noticed these being used in other communities and thought, oh my God, what would happen in Flagstaff if that actually happened? And we were trying to make a measurement of the brightness of something at the same time. So they brought that, that concern right away to the city and uh, the city was very receptive to their concerns. And that ended up with the adoption of the first, what we in Flagstaff call the first uh, lighting law or lighting ordinance directed specifically at protecting the astronomical quality of the night sky in 1958. So that's quite a bit lo uh, longer ago than uh, the uh, international dark sky movement begun by the IDA. Uh, initially though, that shows an astronomical focus at the beginning. It was something to protect the ability of astronomers to measure the brightnesses of, sky, of stars or other astronomical objects without having a searchlight swimming, swept, uh, sweeping through the field and fouling up the observation. That seems very esoteric to your average person. Uh, what our efforts since have evolved into is trying to make this into a much broader community-based concern about the value of the night and the value, the community value and quality of life contributions that a natural night can bring to everybody, not just astronomers. The uh, Dark Skies Coalition itself was founded in 1999 by other people than myself, people who weren't astronomers at all. Uh, Lance Diskin and John Graham had brought up the concern of the protecting dark skies for people who are just interested in looking up and being 
inspired by the perspective it gives, uh, being able to look at the universe overhead to anybody. At, and they formed the coalition and the mission statement, statement of the coalition, which you might be able to read on the uh, webpage here that uh, we have on the screen, is to celebrate, promote, and protect the glorious dark skies of Flagstaff in Northern Arizona. And it's really important to point out the first word and the one we focus the most on is celebration, really to do all kinds, uh, to enhance and to promote all kinds of ways of connecting with the night beyond, including, but also beyond, including science, but also beyond it. Uh, so that's what, that's what the coalition has done and what Flagstaff has really uh, accepted wholeheartedly uh, uh, bringing the culture and awareness and the beauty of night into our awareness throughout the community, not just the observatories, but uh, schools and writers and artists and performers of all kinds, uh, the com business community increasingly so. It's really become uh, from top to bottom and left to right throughout the culture of Flagstaff. And it really makes a big difference for not only the quality of life of the people who now are more aware of the, the contributions that the night skies can make to everybody, but also to our ability as a community to focus on it and, and give the needed attention and resources to help assure that it stays as best quality as it can. Yeah, and you know, you and I uh, wrote an article in Astronomy Magazine a couple of years ago, and and pointed out, you know, it's it, you go around Flagstaff and uh, you go to uh, late for the train coffee and get a dark sky mocha, and there's dark sky lane and a local acrobatic nonprofit dark sky aerial. It's it's really become ingrained into the the fabric of of the community and and a, a true community value, and it's it's just amazing how you can stand downtown and and the amount of stars you can see and, and the milky way from right from downtown right um so yeah so one of the um you know i know we refer to this as the flagstaff solution and and one of the things that we really focus on a lot i i know here is management of spectrum you know and we talked about this a little bit in our last dark sky cosmic coffee sort of the, the three legs of the proverbial stool. Uh, and everyone is familiar, I think, with the first two, which is uh, to fully shield your light so the light's only going downward, as well as to, to establish reasonable uh, amounts of illumination per acre. Um, but one that's much harder to get across and much less widely implemented is good management of the spectrum. And certainly, you know, that was, a I know, a key component of the 1989 ordinance that specified low pressure sodium. And now, of course, we've had all this work recently with the switch to LEDs. So maybe we can talk about this a little bit and because uh, it's a slightly more esoteric aspect of how you preserve the quality of the night sky. Right. And it's and, and it's interesting that as esoteric as it is, and, and in many cases, uh, people seem to think it's, uh, I think they underestimate its importance. Uh, it's actually once you get shielding out of the way, uh, and believe me, that's not a given for most communities, oh, getting yeah. shielding out of the way. In Flagstaff, uh, I, I hope I point out to our, our, our listeners, our, our uh, participants here, and maybe they've noticed it already, but if you drive around Flagstaff, certainly you don't see that every light is great. Uh, most lights are pretty good by comparison to other communities, but that particularly becomes obvious if you go to another community and you realize, and you can how, how different it is in Flagstaff. Uh, sometimes, and I don't want to single out other communities, but sometimes driving along Interstate 40 uh, and by chance going through another community at night, like Albuquerque is one that comes to mind. I am struck by how poorly shielding is addressed by many, many communities. But anyway, uh, once you get beyond shielding uh, and to an extent uh, limiting the overlighting, which happens in some areas that Jeff just referred to, uh, by limiting or by establishing essentially reasonable lighting budgets so that people don't blow, uh, you know, craters in the ground with the extra light that they might use. Uh, then spectrum is very important and it can make dramatic changes if in the, in the appearance of the night sky. Uh, what Flagstaff, probably many people who live here, if you've been around at night, you notice that we have a lot of yellow lights. And I'd like to share another screen here, which shows a little bit about what that looks like 
if you change the kinds of lights you use, uh, the roads that are with your lights to the same level, uh, what, what technically might be called the same uh, uh, foot candle level or the same lux illumination, uh, but use a different spectrum. If you, if you could imagine in Flagstaff, for example, taking all of the yellow lights we have out there, which are used for our roadways and used in most of our parking lots, and instead switch them out and replace them with LEDs, which are of much discussion in the last five to 10 years, uh, which are almost always white, uh, same amount of light, the same amount of what we would call uh, light by lumens or the illumination level on the parking lot or road, the amount of sky glow that's produced would, could dramatically change. This simulation you can see flipping back and forth between two slides is actually uh, partly a measurement and partly a simulation of measurements made from Walnut Canyon, just to the east side of Flagstaff. And you can mm -hmm. see a little, uh, what this is, is a, the whole sky mapped into what's called a hammer projection of the sky. So it looks like a half of an ellipse, but it actually, covers the whole side sky from left to right is a 360 degrees around the horizon. And from the bottom center to the top, it goes from the horizon to the zenith. Uh, you can see the Milky Way, uh, kind of a curved arch, a mottled arch across the uh, picture there. Mm -hmm. uh, a bunch of stars, which are uh, the stars that you can see in the sky. And then the glow over the center uh, covering many of the stars uh, concentrated near the center. Actually, on the left side, where the Milky Way dives into the horizon, just a yep. little bit halfway to the left side, you can see another glow on the horizon there. That's not Flagstaff, that's Phoenix. Mm -hmm. But anyway, the interesting thing is here, uh, the, we're, we're going back and forth between two different spectra. We're going from a, a yellow source, called HPS in this case, to a white source called LED. And even though the amount of light is the same on the ground, the amount of light that's installed in Flagstaff is the same. Look at how much greater the sky glow is when you switch to the white LED. Uh, that's kind of measured on the left side with that little bar graph that shows with the yellow lights we're using, you, the simulation shows you can see about 5,000 stars in the full sky. If you switch to the white LEDs, that drops by 40% to 3,000 stars. It's a dramatic change. So yeah, that's underappreciated in how important the spectrum is. Now, yellow lights are not appropriate for every light use. Uh, many, many uses outdoors at night you wouldn't want to use uh, yellow lights for. But the majority of lighting is just basically providing the ability to find your way around, uh, to see pedestrians on the side of the road well, uh, that you wouldn't see so well with the headlights of your car or to find your car in the parking lot and then find your way to parking spot and then your way into the store. But if you were eating at a restaurant outdoors, by golly, you wouldn't want yellow light necessarily for that. We're not saying that white LEDs or, the, or white, L, white light is something you should never use, but it should be generally avoided because its impacts on the night are so much greater than the yellow lights. And Flagstaff has really embraced that solution since, uh, since the late 80s, really. And in the LED era, that's something that we've continued to lead the way on, which Jeff alluded to. Right. And the, the HPS you're showing there uh, stands for high pressure sodium for our listeners who might not know what that means. And that's the very common um, lighting you see along roadways, typically in the roundish Fixtures. It's got kind of a straw yellow color. Um, what you what you see below there um, with the, the picture of the parking lot has been the hallmark in Flagstaff for quite some time. And those, I believe, are the low pressure sodium fixtures, which are truly monochromatic. Um, but they're also now uh, discontinued and really forcing the issue um, in Flagstaff as well as elsewhere. Um, uh, communities switching to LED and as you know, the default is to switch to these white LEDs and, and particularly the high temperature white LEDs with, with high blue content in the spectrum. But um, let's maybe talk about the Flagstaff solution because we are converging on a solution um, that will use um, 
a much narrower spectrum LEDs. Now, quickly, before we before we go to that, let me just deal with a couple of comments and questions that have come in. Okay. Um, so one one comment from Glenn Frank um, uh, remarks that he had noticed when he was in Flagstaff that the lights were the yellow orangey color and he was not aware that was tied to keeping the light pollution down. And so yes, absolutely, Glenn, that is that is critical. And you know, with proper awareness and education, you know, the, there's no reason those lights can't be used elsewhere and it would greatly reduce sky glow and communities that decided to use them. Question from um, um, Terry Pantano. Um, while you're discussing lighting spectrum, the amount of stars visible with LEDs is definitely less. What's the effect of new LED headlights on night vision, especially the bluish hues? Good question. I know Chris can address. <laughs> Well, I, I'm not actually, that's a good, it is a very good question. And certainly all of us, not just in, in the LED era, but for the last uh, 15 or more years, these new bright uh, lights on some cars that you, automobiles that you see, which I'm sure they're just great to be sitting behind them and having them shining out. And you can see uh, so much more, partly because they're brighter, partly because they're, as Jeff calls them, higher, higher color temperature. So they have more blue content. It's, it's very bright. And, you know, when you're driving on a highway, more visibility is better for you. But you need to balance that, of course, against the impacts on the people who are driving the other way on the highway. And many of us, I'm sure, have muttered under our breath or worse uh, when we have one of those cars coming down the highway toward us. And uh, it makes the it really compromises the vision of the other the people on the other side uh, of that kind of light, the white light. Uh, uh, sometimes we call it blue rich, although they don't necessarily appear blue. They, they, they feel they appear maybe more blue white. Uh, there is definitely more blue in the spectrum if you sp spread the spectrum out. Uh, those cause uh, a lot greater glare sensation. So even if you're not looking at the headlights, which of course you're probably holding your hand up and shielding your, uh, your eyes from these headlights sometimes, the amount of glare that's produced by these is substantial. And what glare does is it inhibits your ability, it compromises your ability to see areas outside of the field of view. You're not looking at the headlight, you're looking, trying to look at the roadway. Uh, but that glare source uh, of the other car approaching you on the other lane, it really compromises your ability to see with your own headlights. Whether you have the super bright ones or not, it compromises your ability. And most of us don't have the super bright ones. I believe that most of the really bright headlights we're seeing are, I'm not sure yet that there are LEDs being used in headlights. The previous generation was these, what they call HID headlights, which are not incandescent, which incandescent lighting has dominated headlights for since the creation of automobiles more than a hundred years ago. Uh, in the last 20 years, those had switched to what are called HID lights, which are high intensity discharge which are the kinds of lights that we use for roadways like high pressure sodium. Those are much greater intensity. And when they started putting those in automobiles, that's when we started seeing these enormously bright headlights. And these were usually white. Uh, these were always white colored lights uh, in, the, uh, in the new headlights. Uh, if they're doing LEDs as well, I wouldn't be surprised. They also are tending to favor these broad spectrum blue rich sources, which really dramatically increased glare for oncoming traffic. That definitely yeah. is something which it seems to me the engineers who are designing these have not adequately balanced yet. The improved visibility for the driver behind the headlights against the compromised visibility for the oncoming drivers. And the LEDs are uh, a growing product segment in the automotive headlight industry since I have actually my oldest uh, uh, number one, uh, mechanical engineer son happens to have landed his first job in that business, perhaps ironically enough. And so um, I, I know that they are um, integrating LEDs in, into those into those products. <clears throat> um, OK, so maybe uh, since yellow or, or as we often call it, amber is kind of the order of the day, um, you know, LPS is now discontinued. And so then the question is, what, what's available on the LED front? And I know, Chris, when we started talking with the city about this several years ago, the, the available amber LEDs were simply not feasible from an economic standpoint, but those have gotten better. And now there, there are a couple of flavors of amber LED that are quite viable for communities uh, to adopt, both operationally as well as 
in terms of expense. So let, let's cover that a little bit. Yes, um, it's an interesting thing that history has created these low intensity IDs, which are finally, in the last 10 years or so, bright enough to begin using for outdoor lighting applications where you need lots of light. Uh, they have also switched toward these broad spectrum light lighting. And it's interesting to watch. I mean, it's always sold as uh, this is just better than yellow lights. It's just that uh, yellow lights are now just disparaged commonly. It's interesting, though, when the yellow lights, the, the amber lights, the previous technologies like high pressure sodium were created, it was interesting to look at the, the terminology used by the industry to try to persuade people to get rid of their old, in those days, it was mercury vapor lights and replaced them with high pressure sodium. Uh, and they were they had all these wonderful marketing terms about golden light that they would use for that yellow, that, those previous generations of yellow lights. But now when we've created uh, white LEDs, the, the yellow is, the golden yellow is now called dingy yellow or ugly mm -hmm. yellow or orange. And it's not really that the lights have changed at all. It's just partly that uh, it's partly marketing. They're trying to convince people that all those yellow lights, which previously were just thought to be great and, in fact, are probably entirely adequate for most applications, now, well, wouldn't you really rather replace them with these nice, brand new white LEDs? And to help persuade you, we're going to try to convince you that that other stuff is dangerous, if possible. Right. And so as you can see here is that the there are options, though, in the yellow, in the yellow or amber LED, uh, in amber spectrum in LEDs, which uh, outside of Flagstaff, it's almost as if they don't exist. And we found it's been very difficult to get people to open their eyes to these other alternatives, which can preserve many of the sky glow benefits and still at the same time give you many of the, uh, many of the uh, benefits of LEDs, uh, particularly one of the main benefits of LEDs. It's not actually energy efficiency, which is what you always hear they are somewhat more efficient than some of the previous technologies. But the main advantage by far is that they are hoped to be much, much lower maintenance and last for five to 10 years between burnouts, which is much, much better uh, than the previous technologies. You would have to get out there with high pressure sodium or low pressure sodium lamps and replace burned out bulbs every few years. And that's expensive. So these amber, uh, options in the LED world can preserve some of those long life options and low maintenance costs for LEDs. But if you go to the amber versions rather than the white ones, you can also uh, minimize your impact on dark skies, at least when you go to the amber ones in applications where it's appropriate, like roadways or parking lots. The spectra you can see on the screen now show at the very top this, what Jeff described as the almost monochromatic spectrum of low pressure sodium. You can see the spectrum is split out here uh, with a spectroscope. So any blue light would be on the left side of the screen and any red light would be on the right. In fact, a few spectra down there, you can see a uh, spectra that show all of those colors. But the low pressure sodium gives you basically all your light in that uh, yellow or orange yellow emission line there, astronomers would call that emission line, uh, which is right there at that transition between yellow and orange. That turns out to be very beneficial as we've talked about already for minimizing sky glow. The LEDs that we're generally seeing uh, are even off the bottom of this screen and I'll scroll down just a little more to show you what the LEDs we're mostly seeing mm -hmm. in the world, but perspective. And you see what Jeff's talking about when he says a blue rich spectra we see there. There's very lot, lots of spectrum uh, being emitted in the violet, blue, and particularly the green is also important. Uh, important in the sense that it causes lots of light pollution. But if you go back up on the spectra here and look at the amber options, you can see that there are a couple which are not quite as narrow in the upper bottom but not as wide as the lower ones down, the white LEDs. The previous technology, by the way, and this might be hard to read on your screen, is this one here. That's the high pressure sodium. You can see it's very heavily favored in the yellow and red portion of the spectrum. A little bit of blue and teal, but mostly, and not very much green, mostly yellow and red. There is an LED above that, which is very similar to high pressure sodium, and that's the one that Flystaff is really looking at closely. 
it's all, it's been required by the way in our general lighting for like parking lots uh, for quite a number of years. But the recent work that Jeff and I have been involved with the city is regarding the decision about roadway lighting. Right. And so the, the narrow band amber, if you look closely at the, the little, uh, the names in the leftmost column there, NBA is narrow band amber LED, really the, the, the best possible LED standard for, for outdoor lighting with, with quite a narrow uh, spectrum, the closest approximation we have to LPS and really in terms of its impact on sky glow, comparable to the low pressure sodium. Um, but it is uh, less efficient and more expensive to install and operate. Um, so for you know, a very budget-minded community that, that wanted another option, um, two, two columns, two, two rows below it, the PCA there, the phosphor converted amber, um, is increasingly viable. I mean, I believe, Chris, it's almost as efficient and cost effective as this point at this point as white. Maybe not quite, but within what, five to ten percent, I think. So it's yes. certainly a viable option. Right. Yes, in most cases, uh, the, the, of the of the spectra we see here, um, low pressure sodium is very efficient. I mean, it uses very little energy to provide a given amount of light. The LEDs, uh, the white LEDs we're seeing so much of in recent uh, years are similar to that. That's why I point out early on that the energy efficiency is really not quite the uh, be all end all that you'll hear about in the industry. And that's actually uh, quite a shock to people when you bring that up. They're, they're all, they've been hearing us so much that they're, all, they're, they're, uh, they're reluctant to believe what we're saying when we say that, that they're not as efficient as people say. They're, they are efficient, but so are the previous technologies. High pressure sodium and low pressure sodium were very efficient. But uh, Jeff was pointing out that the, the, the amber LED that preserves the best sky glow characteristics, unfortunately, is significantly less efficient efficient. So it's definitely a trade-off. You need to look at all dimensions of, an, of a complex problem to decide what, pri what, what uh, aspects you give the most priority to. And any solution which emphasizes only one and ignores all the others is usually not going to be the best solution. So if you em emphasize only energy efficiency, then you will get a light that's not going to uh, give you a very good sky protection. So Flagstaff is making a more we think a more balanced decision for some lighting to use these less efficient but much lower environmental impact or sky glow impact amber LEDs, right. which is this and one up here, the narrow, narrow band amber with a narrower spectrum. But also, you know, at least for a while, um, you know, this this won't be the standard, but for a while we will be using some PCA and Flagstaff where the city wants to get a bit more illumination on the roadways or where the pole spacing uh, demands their use. And you really, if you look at the spectra, you, it's very hard to tell the difference visually between an MBA and a PCA. They, they look very similar to the eye. The PCA just has slightly wider band pass, therefore you get a little more illumination, a bit more color resolution. Um, so, so yeah, they're, they're, they're interesting and, and viable solutions. And I will say even the NBAs, you know, since we started talking with the city five years ago, um, they have increased dramatically in terms of their efficiency by a factor of, I guess, about three, probably. So even those are becoming more viable uh, economically for, for people to implement. Now, Chris, one question about the spectrum that people ask a lot, and then we can move on to the, the Flagstaff Star Party. Um, um, the, these amber LEDs, they're, they're not as widely commercially available, but you can get PCAs, correct? Actually, both of them are becoming more widely available. Uh, okay. It's partly, I think, stimulated by Flagstaff's efforts uh, because many other communities have been, I think, misdirected away from Amber Solutions so they don't ask for it, and therefore the industry doesn't respond. But if you start getting people making requests, then product lines start to show up as available. It definitely, though, takes an extra effort to get the Amber Solutions. Uh, there's a lot of confusion up there. Uh, that Flagstaff is doing its best to clarify. Right. And that certainly was, you know, that was written right into the original uh, proposal um, with the city to, to do this amber LED study was that we wanted the outcome to be a demonstration project, not just a, a good dark sky preserving 
solution for Flagstaff, but something where we could put informational material, almost like a, a press kit together that others, other communities could use to get good information. And, and I'll tell one anecdote that, that I always find amusing. You know, when we, during this process, this discussion here in Flagstaff, we converged on wanting to test out um, a couple hundred narrowband amber and I remember the city put out a, re a request for proposals to about five different lighting vendors and every single one of them, all five of them came back non-responsive, basically saying, what is it with the amber? That's not what you want. Here's the white LED selection that, that you're going to want to choose from. And we had to start all over and go back to them and say, no, this is actually what we want. <laughs> no, white, white is what you really want. You guys apparently are confused. You really want white. <laughs> <laughs> um, here's a good question from uh, GKC Geoscience, that's uh, Kent Polbath, hi Kent, um, and he asks, why do the white lights generate more sky glow per lumen? Does the blue reflect off the ground more efficiently? Yeah, there's, there's a, a good answer there. That's a great, that's a great question, and most of the world uh, misunderstands why it causes more sky glow. There is, the physicists, especially and astronomers are lumped in that group, love to go into the increased scattering in the atmosphere and they talk about Rayleigh scattering and the wavelength dependence in the blue sky and I'm going to avoid all of that because my research has shown and people seem to still ignore that paper that that is a very small effect uh, and it and actually it, it, it goes both ways depending on which whether you're nearby to the light source or far away from the light source. The main reason that these blue and green rich, rich light sources cause more sky glow is that the dark adapted human eye is more, much more sensitive to green and blue light. Now, when you're really dark adapted, you don't perceive colors anymore. That's one of the interesting and kind of fascinating things about night visions is that you lose color, color perception but you are still much more sensitive to some wavelengths than others. And that's the real reason that these blue and green rich sources produce so much sky glow visible to the human eye. And that's because even though you don't see the color of that glow coming back from the sky, your eye is very sensitive to the blue and green portion of that. And if you're using white lights, that blue and green portion is significantly up. It can be four, five, even more times greater than it is from a yellow light source. If you switch from the best light sources to a basic, most commonly promoted white light source, you can easily quintuple the amount of sky glow the eye will see. Right, right. Um, so yeah, very good question. And that's sort of going back to going back to the headlights question. And and you know, the reason these look so glary is, you know, as it gets dark and your eye shifts from what we call the the photopic regime to its scotopic or nighttime sensitivity, you're, you're shifting into that, into that blue, blue regime where the LEDs are just pounding out the light. Um, right. So it's a very good question. Um, and uh, I, I think going back to the, the bit about the companies telling us what kind of lights we actually want, uh, Glenn Frank just comments that we're, it's sort of like we're turning the marketing back on the marketers. If there is a demand then they'll react to it. And if there's not a demand, they'll promote what they want to do. And that's exactly right. We're trying to reverse engineer demand. And um, that was very intentional when we went into the Flagstaff LED project with the idea we would get something that, you know, we could hold up as a, a, a demonstration. And to that event, I'm, I'm actually glad we're going to be using a mix. I think it's going to be about 70% of the narrow band amber, but 30% at least initially of the phosphor converted amber before they're eventually changed out because that's a solution that that probably other communities are a little more likely to to be able or want to adopt than the NBA and we'll be able to show show both as a, a really good demonstration piece. Mm -hmm. Okay, so one reason we are covering this topic of dark skies in Flagstaff now and we'll wrap up the show with this is this is, it's September, we're coming up on the, the usual time of year for the Flagstaff Festival of Science. And for several years, we have had, in conjunction with that, the Flagstaff Star Party. So let's let's talk about a little bit and put in a plug for the virtual event this year. 
Yeah, uh, we're all struggling a little bit, so we hope uh, you, the viewers, and will get all of their friends and uh, uh, go to the websites for the Festival of Science and for the uh, Flagstaff Dark Skies Coalition or Flagstaff Star Party. Either one of those websites will connect you to our events. And uh, uh, enjoy what we're producing uh, in terms of virtual events, uh, some, some live events. Uh, next week, we're going to have a live uh, streamed uh, telescope viewing. Uh, uh, in conjunction with our partners at Lowell Observatory. Uh, so people can uh, look at some live uh, views through the telescope and get some narrations from some particularly broad-minded people, scientists and an artist who are well, gonna try to give insight into the scientific and aesthetic dimensions of what a sky uh, overhead is like and what it means to people outside of science, uh, with science and illuminated by science, but beyond science as well. This star party, uh, we will not have the three nights of in-person telescope viewing at Buffalo Park that we have had in the previous six years. Uh, we, we really anticipate that we'll be able to get back to that wonderful and exciting and well-attended event next year. Buffalo Park in Flagstaff is a stupendous place to look at night skies. It's easy to get to. Even though we won't be having telescopes up there, we encourage everybody to take advantage of our Buffalo Park at night because Take your lounge chair out there in a blanket and uh, go out there and spend half an hour just looking at the stars with your family. It will, it will, it can change your life if you haven't done it frequently. Uh, just looking at the sky and expanding your mind into the depths of space and into the broad expanse of time that you will think about when you look at the sky can create huge value and awareness and awe. Uh, so go to the website here, the flagstaffstarparty.org or flagstaffdarkskies.org, and uh, you will able to be, able to be easily able to find the uh, links to the events. Uh, I'm showing one page here, but you will be able to find it on your own as well without me giving you explicit uh, URLs at the moment. Just look for Flagstaff Dark Skies or flagstaffstarparty.org. Yeah, okay, thanks, Chris. And, and you know, just to be explicit about that, you know, all of the... Uh, Images that Chris has been showing during the show are, are straight from the flagstaffdarkskies.org website. So this is like a presentation you can immediately go to. Um, for my, this is one of the, the best, certainly, uh, dark sky websites out there, particularly the discussions of uh, spectrum impact on the sky. So it's a really good resource uh, if you want to, to uh, uh, visit there. And, and of course, you'll notice the the button at lower left that points out you can join FDSC too um, and, and support them directly. Um, yeah, so, we'd love yeah. to have your help. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there we go. So describes how you can be a member. Um, so a couple of questions have come in. Um, we'll just ask listeners for any uh, Q&A before we wrap up for the week here. Um, so there's two there's, there's two that are related and, and one slightly different one. So let's go back first to the dark adapted eye. Terry Pantano asks a um, sen sensible question. And, you know, we pointed out that, that the impact is because these blue rich lights are lined right up where your eyes sensitivity uh, lands during the night, which is the reason for the glare. But he asked, wouldn't that actually be better to have lighting that is that is matched to the sensitivity of, of the human eye? That's, that's a really good question. And it actually, uh, it leads into a very common misunderstanding, which sometimes is a misunderstanding. And sometimes I think it's used as a, uh, it's kind of a willful misunderstanding uh, in the lighting industry. Uh, and astronomers were particularly aware of this issue about dark adaptation. I mean, that's something we are all very, very aware of as astronomers. We work all the time, or we work, many of us work frequently at night. So we've become very aware of the difference between daytime vision and nighttime vision. Uh, it turns out that when you're talking about outdoor illuminated environments at night, the industry would have you believe that you are dark adapted and therefore you need to use a light which is most tuned, the spectrum is most tuned to that sensitivity, which is just the, the way your question was leading. But it turns out that in illuminated environments at night, even though you are not 100% fully daytime light adapted or photopic as Jeff mentioned a while ago, you are almost light adapted. You are definitely not dark adapted, but if you turn your gaze from the illuminated parking lot or the roadway 
and look up at the night sky and give yourself 10 minutes for your eyes to adapt to that darker environment or the darker field of view of the night sky, your eyes will slowly shift to that true dark adaption, much fainter now, as you know, people call the sky black. It's not black, but it's definitely fainter than the ground, even illuminated ground at night. And that's where that problem with the enhanced brightness of these blue and green rich sources causes more sky glow where it really doesn't give you much advantage to seeing uh, in the parking lot or on the roadway when you're driving. Okay, thanks. Um, and then the, um, Terry had a second question, which also was asked uh, by uh, Juan Tanis. Hi, hi Juan. Um, can you speak about whether the spectrum of the light also affects nature around us is the question from Juan and, and Terry was interested in the effect on animals and you know the answer there is certainly yes there are impacts yes, yes that that's there, there's a lot of research going into the effect of light on critters at night or ecology uh, I think it's there's a lot not known yet and every critter has different behaviors different degrees of activity at night how much it's affected by light how much it's not affected by light uh, whether they're even responsive to the lunar cycle, full moons and, and new moons. Uh, there's tremendous diversity and many, probably thousands of different answers for different critters. It's important to recognize, however, that we are part of that environment. And the fact that we've talked about the difference in the impacts of these spectra on our day vision versus our night vision is really an example of an impact on a biological system. So that this blue and green rich light has so much greater impact on our eyes at night is really kind of a, it's kind of an alarm that's going off that we all should be listening to that we need to pay attention to the effects of spectrum on biological systems. And we are just one example, but there are many, many other examples where blue and green are also being found to be much greater impacts, not just on critters, but even on other aspects of our biology, our health, for example our circadian rhythms, our day and night cycles of hormones in our body that help us uh, uh, help us synchronize with uh, day, and night, day and night uh, waking and sleep cycles are also affected very much by these blue and green contents, not just our ability to see stars, but our ability to sleep. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I'll just to, to add to that broader impact, and you, you've heard me mention this before, Chris, I may have even mentioned it in the interview a couple months ago with Ruskin, but you know, I've been participating in a cancer prevention study for 20 years where they, they send you a, a questionnaire and just ask you about your lifestyle and, and health and everything. And clearly, they're just trying to collect data from, I don't know, three or 4,000 participants um, on what are risk factors for various types of cancer. And in the most recent iteration of that poll that they send around. It's a big online thing, like a survey you fill out. There's this whole section, this whole new section on my daily exposure to light. And they want to know, you know, do I have a nightlight in my bedroom? Is, am I under natural light, artificial light? Do, you know, you know what, what are the conditions outside? And, and just lots of details about how the, the cycle of light and dark is playing out in my life. Because the medical community is clearly, um, noticing that there are potential impacts here. Um, question from, uh, another question from Terry. Um, I have heard that red light is not the best for night vision adaptation. Um, it, it, um, so is, I, I guess, is that the case? It's uh, the, the second sentence might've gotten a little cut off or, um, and, and they, Terry wants to know what kind of lights we're using at the Goto. We are using um, amber lights. So we're using, uh, and, and in fact, with our, our plans for our campus outreach expansion, you know, a campus-wide lighting plan that models best dark sky lighting practice using the narrow band amber LEDs um, for wayfinding, probably using red lights near the telescopes where the impact on night vision is, is minimal. Um, and I think that's probably getting back to Terry's other question. You know, when we're stargazing, we'll use flashlights with red cellophane or something over them or, or using very reddish lights that basically don't uh, impact. Like you were saying before, Chris, those, those lights are not going to take your scotopic vision and transfer it back into the photopic 
area. Whereas, you know, if you're looking at a brilliantly illuminated parking lot at light at night, you know, those lights are, you're seeing color. Those lights are triggering that response back the other way. And then when you look back into darkness, your vision is just trashed. Right. I, I think it's clear. I've seen a little bit of discussion about whether red lights are ideal for protecting your night vision at a telescope. And uh, uh, it, it, is it is clear that you want to get as red as you can. The reason you want to get red is because you're getting farther and farther away from having any impact on the rod cells on your dark vision. You have some impact even with red. I mean, you could, your rods, the, the, dark, the, dark, the cells that give you your dark vision, your night vision, can see red a little bit, but they can, the, the um, impact on those cells is less than one tenth, I think, of what it is on the, your day vision cells. And you can knock those day vision cells out all you like uh, while you're at the telescope. And if you go back uh, and look through the eyepiece, you know, that's your, essentially 100% your rods are back in business there. So that's why yeah. we use red lights is because you can see uh, mostly using uh, your cone cells and your day vision to read the chart or to avoid tripping over the telescope mount. But uh, your, it has the least impact on your dark, dark, dark adapted vision, which is what you're using to look at the sky and stars. And actually, there's, there's, you know, once we're back open, you can come do this experiment at the Godo. And in fact, I did it with a private group just last week. We were up at the Godo observing, and we turned uh, our eight-inch moonraker refractor on the full moon, um, which was rising, and you know, it put it low to the east. And so you look through the eyepiece at the full moon with an eight-inch refractor, and and. In Enjoy the, the glorious sight of the, the craters and the mountains, and then pull your face away from the telescope, and you can see absolutely clearly out of left eye. And I, I was completely blind in my right eye because the, the moon had just just blasted the cones, and and you know it was totally shifted back into the scotopic range, and I couldn't see a thing out of this eye. Okay. And that takes even though you might get functional vision with that eye back, oh, in t uh, 30 seconds or so, the actual ability to see the faintest stars will take 15 minutes or more, even, even 30 minutes before you get maximum sensitivity out of your night vision. It does. And that's and one unfortunate thing. Most people who don't give them, who are not naturally relating to the night, we are a, a, a culture that excludes the natural night from our everyday experience, so to speak. Uh, right. So we very seldom, when we go outside at night, we actually, we are almost always operating with slightly to very compromised night vision. And many people are disappointed in what they can see because of it. They tend to describe things as pitch black and you can't find your way around. That's because a lot of that is because we don't really give our vision the chance to adapt to night. That's why I encourage you when you go to Buffalo Park, take a lounge chair and a blanket so you can get comfortable and give yourself enough time for your eyes really to maximize their sensitivity and you can see a lot. That's right, it, it does take a while. You know, and the, the, the absolute extreme of, of that uh, effect that I've observed when we, we took a, a very high level VIP group out to the four meter Lowell Discovery Telescope. And at the time we didn't have the instrument cube fully populated with instruments, so we had an eyepiece on our 4.3 meter telescope and we put that on the moon <laughs> and you know uh, but but more but seriously you know i think for folks who live in a bright urban environment you walk around at night and your eyes are constantly getting hit with significant illumination levels and it's literally like you look up at the sky and it's almost like you have permanently been looking at the moon through a telescope and your your vision is completely uh compromised but yeah go out for 15 minutes to buffalo park and enjoy everything that is bursting out of the sky at you thanks to thanks to all the good work that Chris and others have done. So I don't see any further questions. So with that, we'll wrap up for the week. Um, I'd like to say thanks very much to, to Chris um, for all the ongoing work on dark sky potential. Um, one not, just Chris, not just Chris, it's a whole team. There are about 30 of us in the Dark Skies Coalition and we have a lot of partners around town, support from funding agencies like Flagstaff Cultural Partners, uh, Coconino County, uh, the Arizona Community Foundation, many businesses in town like Little America, uh, Melissa Collins. Uh, I can't remember all of the sponsors that support our activities, 
but it's really a broad community effort. Uh, I'm at, I may be, or the coalition may be a figurehead in some ways, but it really wouldn't be as effective as it, was, it would as it is without the assistance of all the members of our community. Yeah, and and while we're at it, we also really should mention that the excellent dark sky protection we have here in Flagstaff is due in no small measure to a huge amount of effort and support from the Flagstaff City Council and city staff, particularly in the um, in the traffic uh, department. They've, they've invested a lot of time and effort working with us uh, to find a really good LED solution. So, so we'll thank them as well. So with that, we will we'll wrap up. Just a couple of mentions of things coming up. Um, Chris talked about uh, stargazing from Lowell. Um, we will be doing some of that uh, tonight. Our, interact, our next installment of interactive stargazing from the Giovanni Open Deck Observatory at 8.30 p.m. tonight. Uh, you can call the shots and ask what we might want to see. Join us next week for our next cup of cosmic coffee. We're going to have kind of a, a, a slightly different uh, fun topic for you. I will be here with our uh, staff astronomer, Dr. Gerard Van Bell, and we are going to be talking about uh, representations of space flight in movies and you know who who did it well who's taken a lot of artistic license you know how how does all this work and and you know we're always happy to suspend disbelief but it's it's interesting to look at how different uh visionaries have imagined um space travel so join us next thursday at nine for that until then as always from all of us here at lowell stay well stay safe and we'll see you next week thanks a lot